every morning when our 23-month-old son, Bo, wakes up, I get, get him out of his pack and play. I set him on our bathroom counter while I start getting ready for the day. As I'm brushing my teeth, he wants to grab mom's toothbrush and uh, brush his teeth. Um, I put my contact lenses in. Bo practices putting his in, you know, make sure he doesn't touch his eye. Um, I use the potty. Bo insists on sitting there trying his, his hardest. Um, as children, we instinctively want to take our cues for how to live from our parents, and that is exactly what the Apostle Paul, this morning in Ephesians chapter 5, verses 1 through 21, will exhort us to do spiritually as well. He calls all of us who have been saved, who have been adopted into the family of God, to be imitators then of God. As his beloved children, God brushes you brush, like father, like child. Remember, Paul urged us back in chapter 4 to walk in a manner worthy of your calling to holiness. And Paul began to describe that walk for us as one characterized by humility and gentleness, patience and love, peaceful unity, honesty, righteous anger, hard work and generosity, gracious and edifying speech, kindness, compassion, and forgiveness. Already a pretty uh, long list, but Paul continues now his list in chapter 5. And I'll warn you once again, the sermon will be another that is heavy on the do's and don'ts. Do this, don't do that. But we cannot forget why and how God calls it, us to do any of this. It is as a response that is empowered by what he has already done for us in Christ. We have been saved by grace through faith, not by our obedience to God, but rather because of his great love and mercy, his faithfulness toward us. Chapters 1 through 3 of Ephesians reminded us and celebrated. Therefore, now because of what Christ has done for us, we can now be called to live as the redeemed, purified, transformed people that Christ has made us. That's the second half of Ephesians, chapters 4 through 6. Let us put on that new self recreated after the likeness of God and true righteousness and holiness. So this morning we continue to find out how we do that. I invite you to stand with me as you're able for the reading of God's word from Ephesians chapter 5, verses 1 through 21. I invite you to hear the word of the Lord this morning. Therefore be imitators of God as beloved children and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. But sexual immorality and all impurity or covetousness must not even be named among you as is proper among saints. Let there be no filthiness, nor foolish talk, nor crude joking, which are out of place, but instead let there be thanksgiving. For you may be sure of this, that everyone who is sexually immoral or impure, who, who is covetous, that is, an idolater, has no inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore, do not become partners with them, for at one time you were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. For the fruit of light is found in all that is good and right and true. And try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. Take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. For it is shameful even to speak of the things that they do in secret. But when anything is exposed by the light, it becomes visible. For anything that becomes visible is light. Therefore, it says, awake, O sleeper, and arise from the dead and Christ will shine upon you. Look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of the time, because the days are evil. Therefore do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is, and do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart, giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father 
in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. Paul begins by quickly but importantly reminding us here of why we walk in holiness in the first place. He offers us two reasons. First, because, as we open with, we are children of God. Those who want to, therefore, imitate our Holy Father. And we are not just children, we are beloved children. I think of my own children lately. Ellery, my daughter, asked me to play every day after work. Can we go outside and pepper the volleyball together in the yard? She might ask me, to do that if she was just a child, just to spend time with me or perhaps to try and earn my love. But how much more motivated is she knowing that she's already got it? She is already my beloved child. Beloved children love spending time with their parents because who doesn't love being loved? And enjoying a game together, a game that I love, is an opportunity for her to experience my love for her as well. Church, holiness is the game that our Father loves to play. He is holy, 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 and he invites us to come play with him in the yard and experience his love for us as we do so. And speaking of love, that is Paul's second reason now for walking in holiness, because we are loved by Christ. We walk in love, verse 2, as Christ loved us. First John 4, we love because he first loved us. Not only does my love for my daughter make her want to play volleyball, it makes her want to love me in return, response as well. Jesus said, greater love has no one than this, that he laid down his life for his friends. And yet Jesus laid down his life for us while we were still his enemies. He gave himself up for us. Verse 2 says here, Jesus said, no one takes my life from me, I lay it down of my own accord. Willingly. That's how much he loved you. Enough to go to the cross voluntarily for you. Suffer the most agonizing death imaginable and give himself up as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God in your place. Hebrews 9.26 says, Christ appeared once for all to put away our sin, to remove our sin by the sacrifice of himself. And so Paul reasons, if Jesus was willing to do that for you, if he was willing to literally die so that you and I might experience spiritual life, the least that we can now do in response is to spiritually die to our sins so that he, Jesus, might now live and love through us by the power of his Spirit. This is the Christian calling. May we walk in love. You want to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you've been called in Christ? walk in love. And what does it look like to do that in practice? Paul defines a walk of love and holiness for us now in verses 3 and 4 especially. Five characteristics of walking that way. For starters, we walk in purity in our actions, in our deeds. The Christian walk, as we imitate Christ, necessarily excludes sexual immorality, and all impurity. The first Greek word there is porneia. It's the root of our word pornography, but in the Greek, it's much broader, referred to any form of sexual out-of-boundness, sexual sin, fornication, adultery, lust, homosexuality, polyamory, list goes on. All of it is prohibited here. And then Paul broadens the scope even more, though, to rule out not just sexual immorality, but all impurity, an impure love of self, pride. Impure love of stuff, greed. An impure love of sin, licentiousness. The list goes on. But it mustn't go on for the imitator of God, for the lover of Christ. Such worldliness must not even be named among you, Paul says. He's, he's of course, not saying, don't even mention such sins. Like, if we don't talk about them, like, you know, Voldemort and use his name, maybe he will stop exist, existing or something. Because then, Paul would be breaking his own command here, right? He mentions the sins, and I'm preaching about it. What he literally says here is, they must not be named in you. We often see people on social media list various titles, labels for themselves that define them right beside their name and their profile. Will Duvall, disciple, husband, father, pastor. Here Paul is saying, if you were going to get really honest <laughs> and start listing naming not just the, the roles that you hide behind on your public you know, uh, persona, but the traits that really define you deep down. 
at the core of who you are. That list cannot, it must not read like this. Will Duvall, philanderer, luster, narcissist, hedonist, glutton, drunkard, slanderer, grudge holder, lover of impurity. That kind of behavior cannot name, cannot mark, characterize the life of a believer. Rather, we must walk in purity. Blessed are the pure in heart, Jesus said, for they shall see God. Number two, we also walk in contentment. <laughs> After broadening the scope of sin from sexual immorality to all impurity, Paul now adds a surprising vice in verse three, covetousness. Why? Well, Paul pens a lot of these lists of sins throughout his letters, and he almost always starts with the sin of pornea, perhaps because it's the most, one of the most obvious visible sins. It's also uniquely intimate and defiling, according to 1 Corinthians 6, 18, flee from sexual immorality. Every other sin a person commits is outside of his body, but the sexually immoral person sins against his own body. Don't you know you're a temple of the Holy Spirit? And so Paul begins there, but then he quickly, again, broadens to all impurity, all sins, but now he answers the question, but where do those sins really come from in the first place? Is there like a, a source sin, a root sin behind them all? And I think Paul's answer here is, yes, coveting. A discontented and holy and unholy desire for more. That's the source. We covered this back when we exposited the Ten Commandments in Exodus chapter 20 a couple years ago. Why do we steal? Because we covet a particular object in our hearts. Why do we lie? Because we covet someone else's approval. We're willing to bend the truth to get it. Or we covet control over a particular outcome. And so we're trying to manipulate that into happening. Why do we engage in sexual immor immorality? Because we covet illicit sex. You go right down the list of sins and argue that just about every one of them ultimately can be traced back to covetousness, to a lack of contentment. Contentment is the cure for coveting. Godliness with contentment is great gain, Paul says. I have learned in whatever situation I'm in to be content. Jesus said, take care, be on your guard against all covetousness. It's like really bad for one's life does not consist in the abundance of of more. Covetousness is the insatiable hunger for more. More stuff is greed. More sex, pornea. More self, pride. Go down the list. Covetousness says more. Contentment says enough. Enough. Hebrews 13, 5 says, be content with what you have because God has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. And God wants to know, aren't I enough for you? Is he enough for you this morning? Friends, Christ is more than enough. May we be content in him. Third, we walk in propriety. Paul could have said here, no pornea, no impurity, no coveting, because God is enough. You don't need that stuff. Or he could have said, because God is holy. You've got to imitate and, and be like him. But here he introduces an interesting reason for our holiness because it's not proper among the saints it's just not fitting or suitable your translation may say look we should never be surprised when a sinner sins it is just in their nature paul told us that back in chapter two but we should always be flustered and, and more than a bit troubled when a saint sins because it is no longer in our new recreated spirit-filled nature in christ we expect sin from a sinner, but not from a saint. We expect holiness of saints. That is what is fitting. How do you know what kind of behavior is proper, fitting in the household of God? Every family has, has you know, little different rules. My wife grew up at the country club, so elbows off the table, knowing which fork to use with which dish was like really important rules. I grew up in the South, so saying please and thank you, yes ma'am, no sir, more important. How about in God's family? What is proper? Psalm 119 asks, how can a young man keep his way pure? By guarding it according to God's word. God has not left us in the dark. God has given us guidelines for living. A rule book, a family rule book, as it were. Christians are often quick to point out that the Bible is so much more than a list of do's and don'ts, and that is true. Praise God. The Bible is a story of God's persistent love for us. It's more than a rule book. It's a story of God's love. And yet, it's not less than a rule book. 
right? It is a story, and it's also a standard. It is a guide. It is a, our family rule book that defines and directs and shapes our life and conduct in the kingdom of God. God's word is how we know what kind of behavior is proper among saints. We need to study God's word. We need to keep God's word. Fourth, we walk in in purity, not only of deeds, but in our words as well. Paul raises the bar even higher. I want even your mouths to be consecrated. Let there be no filthiness, nor foolish talk, nor crude joking, which are out of place. Words matter to God. Christians, we don't laugh at the same jokes that non-Christians do. We certainly don't tell them. We shouldn't use the same filthy language either. The Greek word here, filthiness, means obscenity, profanity. I mentioned last week in verse 29 of chapter 4 that when Paul said, let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only that which builds others up, he wasn't really talking about stubbing your toe and letting a four-letter word slip out. He was talking about denigrating others as, a, as opposed to edifying them. But now here in chapter 5, Paul goes even beyond that and does seem to be prohibiting all kinds of obscenity. You say, well, that's just a word. It's just a word. But one way to think about this is that our words are just yet another opportunity for our holiness, literally our set-apartness, to be different than those around us. Not so that we can look or feel morally superior to them, or look down our noses at others, but, but rather so we can stand out in a way that might actually open up an opportunity for us to witness to others, or at least not to ruin it. I love Nate Bargatze. I've quoted some of his jokes, some of my sermons. Funniest guy on the planet. He's the only guest in years that has been asked to host SNL twice in a calendar year, and for good reason. And yet he is also the only one who doesn't swear or talk about sex in his jokes. You know how rare that is? Do you have any idea how hard that is to be funny? Please don't send me your links to your favorite Christian comedians this week. <laughs> Tim Hawkins and John Chris. They're not funny. I... I <laughs> Actually, I, I think a lot of their jokes, cracking jokes about the church, constitute the kind of foolish talk that Paul is warning us against here in verse 4. We don't make light of important spiritual things. But to be funny without having to resort to profanity or smut, it's hard. And just look at the platform that God has blessed a guy like Brian Regan or Nate Bargatze with because of it. They stand out. We Christians ought to be like that, not necessarily with our humor, not everyone is going to have that gift, but we can all use our words in a way that honor the Lord and attract others. If filthiness and crude joking offends others, our words ought to attract them. Fifth, we must walk in thanksgiving. And this is another admonition that seems to come a bit out of the blue. We don't expect Paul to contrast it here with obscenities and foolish talk and crude joking but that's what he does he says don't use your words in that way rather use your words to express gratitude don't give offense give thanks it's a kind of odd juxtaposition but here's what i think paul is highlighting filthiness foolishness foulness they exploit the fallenness of this world they hold up what is ugliest and most broken about this world and say hey look at this laugh at this whereas thankfulness highlights what is best and most beautiful in this world that God has created and, and still superintends and loves and says, praise God for this. Thank you, God, for that. Let's focus on these things. Let there be thanksgiving. I know it's just around the corner, but every day should be thanksgiving in the life of the believer. Paul says later in verse 20, give thanks always and for everything to God the Father. Colossians 3.17, whatever you do, in word or in deed, do everything in the name of Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Now in verse 5, Paul shifts a bit from commending how we ought to walk to cautioning us about why it's so important that we walk that way. Paul has been reviewing the rules. Now he stops to consider the rationale behind the rules and some reminders to help us keep them. First of all, we need to be warned. Verse 5, you may be sure of this, that everyone who is sexually immoral or impure, who, who is covetous, that is an idolater, 
has no inheritance in God's kingdom. Three points I want to make here. First, notice Paul lists idolaters explicitly now. He warned us against porneia, impurity, covetousness, the same list back in verse 3, but now he adds in this parenthetical clarification that he's talking about idolaters specifically. Why? I think that is Paul's shorthand for all sinners. Elsewhere, Paul includes these long lists, like 1 Corinthians 6, sin list, the, the unrighteous don't inherit the kingdom of God. Neither the sexually immoral, same list, nor idolaters, starts the same way, but then he goes, nor adulterers, nor practitioners of homosexuality, nor thieves, nor greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swinders, nor gossip, and he goes on and on. But here, Paul says, look, I can stop just with idolaters, because once again, I think we could argue that this sin really encapsulates all of them. What is idolatry? It's when you, you make something, anything, more important to you than the Lord. That's, that's all sin. <laughs> your, whether it's your spouse, your kids, your job, we've got different names for certain ones of those idols. When you make an idol of your stuff, we call it greed. When you make an idol of sex, we call it lust. When you make an idol of self, we call it pride. And go, go on down the list. But Paul includes idolatry here, I think, to make it clear that all, all, sin, all sinners are excluded from God's kingdom. Second thing to note, Paul actually refers to the kingdom of Christ and God. That phrasing sounds weird, Christ and God. It's the only time it's found this way in the whole Bible. And there are really just a couple other places that even discuss the kingdom as belonging to Jesus at all. It, it, it usually, the Bible would just say, the kingdom of God. So why does Paul mention Christ here? It's often said, to err is human. It's normal to screw up. It's just human nature. Paul says heresy. Because then you've either got to say that Jesus wasn't fully human, or you've got to say that he erred, he sinned. And so I think Paul mentions our inheritance in the kingdom of Christ here to subtly remind us that sin can never be treated as an inevit inevitability in the life of the believer, the saint, the holy one. Sin is no longer just our nature. Don't blame me, it's my nature. We've been given a new nature, created after the likeness of Christ in true righteousness and holiness. Now live like it, Paul says. If idolater was Paul's shorthand for sinner, one who is excluded from God's kingdom, Christ, the kingdom of Christ, is his shorthand for inclusion. The ones who can be included because the kingdom is reserved for perfect people, for, for Christ and those who are in Christ. Heaven is the perfect home of a perfect God. If, if he starts letting imperfection sin in, he's going to ruin it. No, we must put off the old self and put on the new man in Christ. I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And Jesus shows us how to live this whole long two-part sermon last week, this week, on the walk of holiness could really be summed up in a single word. How then shall we live? Christ-like. Christ-like. Keep your way pure by guarding it according to God's word. Sure. But Jesus is God's word. His word made flesh. So if you want to know how to walk, just walk like him. Walk like him as disciples, as followers of Christ. The third and primary point to note here, subpoint under verse 5, is Paul's warning. Why does Paul warn Christians? Remember, he is writing to the saints in Ephesus, the saved folks. You might ask, chapter 1, haven't they been sealed with the Holy Spirit, the guarantee of their inheritance until they acquire the possession of it? Can you really be unsealed and lose that inheritance? Chapter 2, haven't they been saved by grace, made alive together with Christ? Can they really be unsaved, made dead all over again, apart from Christ? And the short answer biblically is no, that God keeps those he calls. But the slightly longer answer is for us to recognize that God keeps those he calls by warning us. His warning is one of the means of God's keeping, his keeping, sustaining grace in our lives. Warn an unbeliever about hell, and he'll scoff. Warn a believer about hell, and she'll shudder. And rightfully so. Nothing will get you back on the straight and narrow quite as quickly as a glimpse on down the road 
of where the path you're currently on, the sinful path, will eventually lead you straight over the cliff. That will sober you up. Some people argue, well, it's better to obey God out of love, not out of fear. Listen, God himself says over and over again in his word, look, I want you to obey me for any and every reason. (laughs) He says, I've got a, a carrot and a stick, and I'm not afraid to use both of them to motivate your obedience. Jesus warned us, fear those, do not fear those who can kill your body but not your soul. Rather, fear him who can destroy both your soul and body in hell. Who's that? Who's the only person who can send anyone to hell? That's God. Fear him. God's word says the fear of the Lord is the very beginning of all wisdom. It's the whole duty of man, fearing God and keeping his commandments. You're called to fear God. Be warned. Paul's second reminder now in verse 6. Be discerning. Let no one deceive you with empty words. Be discerning. It harkens back to Paul's exhortation in chapter 4 to grow up so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. Don't be easy prey for false teachers, for wolves in sheep's clothing. For because of these things, the wrath of God is coming upon the sons of disobedience and you don't want to be standing nearby when the lightning strikes. How do we develop this discernment? You've probably heard it said before, but they say the best way to spot a counterfeit is what? By being so deeply familiar with the real thing. I don't know if it's true or not, but it's repeated so often in sermons, this illustration, that it's kind of got to be true by this point. I'll just quote John MacArthur so you can blame him if it's not true, but here's his book. Federal agents don't learn to spot counterfeit money by studying the counterfeits. They study real bills, genuine bills, until they master the look of it. Then when they see the bogus, fake money, they recognize it. It's certainly true when it comes to truth, to Christian doctrine. The best way to spot Heresy is by knowing God's word, by knowing the truth deeply. Let no one deceive you. Be discerning. Next, Paul says we need to be reminded. Be reminded of who we are and of whose we are. At one time you were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. You belong to him. Walk then as children of light. You are a chosen race, a holy nation, a people of God's own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of that darkness and into his marvelous light. And Paul says you weren't just in the darkness, you were darkness. You were dead in sin, sons of disobedience, by nature children of wrath, doomed for damnation, rightfully so. You were darkness, but now you are darkness light in the lord total transformation therefore walk like it be who you are remember whose team you're on nowadays see there's this cosmic spiritual battle raging all around us paul says don't forget which side of it you're fighting on we'll get to that in here in a couple weeks of ephesians 6 and the the armor of god the spiritual battle paul says don't forget Which side you're fighting on? I I know you were formerly at war against God, but then by grace, he opened your eyes to see, your ears to hear. You heard and received his gospel invitation to leave the futility of your rebellion and come and join the winning side, the good guys, to put off your old self and put on a new uniform to put on Christ. And now Paul's just saying, remember it. Remember it. Fight like it. Fire in the right direction. Walk like the beloved children of God that you are, not like the children of wrath that you once were. And then he reminds us how we walk that way. The fruit of light is found in all that is good and right and true. Whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things meditate on them pursue them strive for them walk in them and if you're still not sure just do your best that's verse 10 try your best paul says to discern what is pleasing to the lord it's not always going to be actually it's often not going to be as clear-cut as good versus evil light versus darkness 
Hey, does God want me to take this new job or stay where I'm at? Does God want us to sell the house and move to this neighborhood or stay where we're at? Does God want me to vote on Tuesday or abstain? Amendment 3 is clear cut. Go vote no on Tuesday. But a lot of other stuff on the ballot, a lot of other decisions we have to make in life, you just do your best to pray and in your conscience try and please the Lord. We want to be discerning, know your Bibles, test the spirits, the mature have their powers of discernment trained by constant practice to distinguish good from evil. That is important. It's important for the black and white decisions, but in the gray, in most of life, in the gray, just do your best to please the Lord. Fourth, we ensure that we stay on the right path by being, staying above board. Above board means to be open, transparent, not hidden and concealed in the dark. Sin loves the dark. It is shameful to even speak of the things that they do in secret, Paul says. Jesus declared, the light, me, I am the light of the world, and I've come into the world, but people love the darkness rather than me, rather than the light, because their works were evil. And everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his work should be exposed. Paul says, that's exactly what I want you to do, is the opposite. He says, take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. Bring them to the light. The light is the best disinfectant for sin. Sin thrives in the dark. It feeds off and grows in the dark, but it shrivels and dies in the light. John Owen said, be killing sin or it will be killing you. Paul tells us here the most effective way to kill your sin. You've got to bring it to the light. When anything is exposed to the light, he says, it becomes visible. It becomes killable. You can't kill what you can't see. David mourned, when I kept silent about my sin and concealed it, my, my bones wasted away. But when I acknowledged my sin to you, O Lord, and did not cover over it, try and hide it, you forgave my iniquity. 1 John 1, if we say we have no sin, we try and stuff it way down and hide it under the shiny, happy Christian faith, a face on, on Sunday mornings, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. But you don't get it. You don't get it unless you bring it to the light. You've got to bring the dirt out from under the rug if you want God to sweep it away for you. And I should also quickly add here that part of, a big part of keeping things above board in your life is confessing our sins not only to God but to one another it is a command actually in scripture James 5 16 confess your sins to one another and pray for one another so that you may be healed the most sinful Christians not surprisingly are always the most isolated this is how wolves hunt they separate separate sheep from the flock and Satan knows you can only show up to life group, to discipleship group, to accountability group, week after week, confessing that sin so much before the light is going to start to shine into that darkness and speak into that darkness. By the way, if that is not what you're doing in your small group, confessing your sins to one another, then what are you even doing? Praying for your neighbor's dog? Don't waste your time <laughs> and don't waste each other's time. I don't know about y'all, I'm, I'm a pretty busy guy, I don't have time for that. Like if my small group is not helping me fight the good fight, wage war against my sin, I don't, got, I don't got time for it. Confess your sins to one another and bring it to the light. Paul's fifth and most important reminder for us here is that if you and I are ever going to walk in holiness, we need more than warnings, we need more than discernment, we need even more than real Christian community that exposes sin and accountability. We need resurrection. We must be resurrected. Jesus said, unless you are born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. Flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. We must be changed, made new, raised 
to a fundamentally new kind of spiritual life. And that is exactly what Paul declares and, and, and celebrates that Jesus has done for us. Remember back in chapter 2, even when we were dead in our trespasses, God made us alive together with Christ. He raised us up with Him. He seated us in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Church, we've been resurrected. Therefore, Paul says, be resurrected. We have been raised to new life. Now walk in that life. Awake, O sleeper. Arise from the dead. Quit praising Christ from the prison cell that he freed you from. Leave it. And then Christ will shine on you. I warned you already, friends, if you try and walk any of this out, God's calling to holiness apart from Christ, apart from the new life that he and he alone can and has actually raised us to, it will be nothing but self-righteous legalism. It is only in Christ when he shines on us and through us that we can walk in a manner worthy of our calling. People who are dead, dead in their sin, don't need a little help. They don't need just a little guidance. They don't need a moral example. They need resurrection. Have you been raised this morning from spiritual death to eternal life in Christ? That's it. That's it. That's game, set, and match for for all of this being holy and and all the way you're supposed to live. You can't do it without that. You've got to be raised to new life in Christ. For those who have, Paul offers us now five final words of exhortation in closing. And we'll go quick. We could, of course, spend a whole Sunday on any one of these verses, any one of these admonitions, but that is, of course, true of all of Ephesians. Trying to take it into chunks that Paul wrote it in. First, Paul says... Walk carefully. Watch carefully how you walk. The landmines are everywhere. Sin is crouching at the door. Satan is prowling like a lion. Watch out. Be vigilant. Keep your guard up and your wits about you. There's no room in the Christian life, in the Christian walk, for coasting. If you are drifting, it will always be into sin. Call it spiritual entropy. All things in this fallen world of ours trend toward chaos and disorder unless they are actively acted upon by Christ. Don't coast. Don't come to church once a month. Don't open your Bible once a week. You need more than that. We cannot live our lives spiritually on autopilot, just blindly going through the motions. We must walk carefully. Second, walk efficiently. He says, make the best use of the time because the days are evil. Life is too short. This world is too dark. We've got to walk quickly. Pick up the pace. Because remember, we are now light in the Lord, Paul said. We walk as children of light. And so Jesus charged us in Matthew 5, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who's in heaven. If we are the light of the world, Christ's hands and feet, and if the world is really as dark as Jesus says it is, then the faster we walk, the more of it we get to brighten in in the relatively few short years that we are given to live here. And as an added bonus, it's also really good for keeping you out of trouble, isn't it? An, An idle mind, it's the devil's workshop. It's a lot harder to fall back into sin and darkness when you're so busy fighting against it actively. The best defense is a strong offense. He says, redeem the time. How about the the good timing of this admonition? We all got an extra hour last night. How are you going to use it? Extra hour of sleep? Awake, O sleeper. (laughs) See how it all comes, ties together? But in all seriousness, what if we treated every hour of every day that way for what it is? as a gift from God to be used, to be redeemed, to be stewarded strategically for His glory. May we make the best use of the time, the relatively few years that God has given us here, to make as big of a kingdom impact as possible. Third, walk wisely. Not as unwise, but as wise. Do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. We covered this quite a bit already. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Be discerning. Grow up to spiritual maturity. So I'm going to go on to point number four. Uh, Walk soberly. Don't get drunk with wine. Rather, be filled with the Spirit. Just make this point on this. I was floored this week. Love what Tim Keller pointed out about this particular injunction. He says, Being filled with the Spirit is to get the thing that people get drunk to try and get. You don't have to get drunk to get the joy 
that the Spirit gives. Alcohol makes you happy because it, it's a depressant. Your brain becomes less aware of your problems. The Spirit operates on the exact opposite principle. The Spirit doesn't make you less aware of your problems. It makes you more aware of Christ. The Spirit takes the person and work of Christ and makes Him so real to you, to your heart, that you begin to say, wait, what were my problems again? The reason we fail to be obedient and make foolish choices in life is because we're not happy enough in Christ. Boy, go home and just chew on that, sip on that this afternoon. But lastly, what does it mean to walk spirit fully? To be filled with the spirit. Paul finishes here with a flurry of four fulls that he wants us to be. Walk cheerfully, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. We ought to sing to one another of God's grace. We walk worshipfully. We sing to him, singing and making melody to the Lord with all your heart. We walk thankfully, cheerfully, worshipfully, thankfully, if you're a slow writer. Thankfully, giving thanks always for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. And fourth, we walk respectfully, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ, doing nothing from selfish ambition, but in humility, counting others as more significant than yourselves, like Jesus who though he was God, he didn't cling to his godness, but instead he emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, a human, a mere human, humbling himself even to the point of death on a cross for you, for me. He gave up his life for us as a ransom for many. Church, that is why we do any and all of this why, why we walk in purity, contentment, and thanksgiving, why we heed God's warnings, why we come to the light remembering our new identity in Christ, why we walk carefully, efficiently, wisely, soberly, spiritfully, cheerfully, worshipfully, thankfully, respectfully. We do all of it because Christ first loved us. So much so that he laid down his life for you to make us holy. May we now walk in it. Amen.